the Spot Track Podcast, talking sports contracts, the salary cap, and business of sports. Welcome into another edition of the Spot Track Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Kravitz, joined by the Sultan of Salary. He, of course, is Mike Gennetti. Mike, the sports world has handed us a gift as of yesterday, so I'm excited to get into that. We'll spend a lot of time diving into it. You know what I'm talking about. And uh, our red hot NFL teams, the Bills and the Dolphins, face each other this weekend. So I'm just hoping more than anything that you and I can keep this civil today. <laughs> yeah, look, I don't get too invested one way or another, especially in week four. But this Dame trade was a holy expletive for me. This was one of those midday, I'm mowing the lawn. I looked down on my phone and I could not believe what I thought what I was seeing. I thought Woj got hacked. Um, not a name any of us were talking about. I mean, you do this thing every day, three, three, four hours a day. Did the Bucks ever come into your, your mindset here with this move? So it's funny you say that because uh, yesterday was, I do a three hour show in Orlando every single day. We tackle the entire sports world locally, nationally, and all that good stuff. I had a whole show plan that I was very proud of some really <laughs> dynamic topics about the NFL. And I had to throw all that out the yeah. window because 30 minutes before we went on the air, the Damian Lillard tra- uh, trade hit. So it was just sort of raw reaction. But the day before, my co-host had asked me, who do you think he ends up with? Who do you think he helps the most in terms of winning a championship? And I said, Philly would be my top option of yeah. places where he could go and put them over the top. Boston would be one. But, you know, I got to get with my guy, Mike Gennetti, to see if they could even make that work financially yeah. because they're already cash strapped. I'm driving home after the show that day after being asked that question. and. On my way home, I thought to myself, I really should have included the Milwaukee Bucks in that conversation. So I was kind of kicking myself that I didn't think of that in the moment. That is the only time that I had thought about Milwaukee throughout this entire process. And here we are. I love it, by the way. I think it's a great fit, and it really does put them over the top. I mean, Vegas tells you that. They're now the odds on favor to win it all. Well, I mean, the the Philly conversation seems so similar, right? I mean, if you got your head around Philly taking him on to to pair with Embiid, that's essentially what's happened here. Um, I I just think Milwaukee had a better piece to send back. And, you know, we'll talk about that. I I love it from the Bucks standpoint too. Um, I guess we can, we can kind of do that, right? We can talk about just our thoughts about all these teams involved. I guess the only thing I don't enjoy, um, it, it's certainly not a lot of bang for buck for Portland yet. But that if they do flip Drew Holiday, they will get more out of this, and then it should maximize their yeah. assets coming home. I just this feels like they're bailing Phoenix out here, you know. And how many times is this going to happen where good teams help other good teams get better? And that's essentially what has happened here in Phoenix. Phoenix was bleeding money, right? They were they were hemorrhaging money. They've been doing it, you know, kind of a, a self serviced situation over the past two seasons. And they were all in again, and they needed somebody to take Aiden off their hands. And it, I can't imagine there were more than one or two teams asking about him. And now he's mixed into this gigantic blockbuster sort of out of nowhere. And I just feel like Phoenix could, is a 1B winner in this whole move, even if oh, they have to take on, you know, the oft injured Nurkic and things like that. They got out of Aiden's deal, and that's pretty unbelievable for them right now. I think that they're all winners, and we can break this down piece by okay. piece. The reason why Milwaukee uh, flew under the radar for me, they do fit the bill in terms of add to an established superstar that's an MVP caliber, that's a big, that can kind of get stuck in the mud come playoff time. For basketball reasons, it made sense. I never took Milwaukee seriously, or at least didn't take them seriously enough, because that's not the kind of organization that makes aggressive moves like this. Miami tries to. Philadelphia, we see Boston do it. You just don't think of Milwaukee as that team that's going to make that sort of uh, an aggressive move. So I love it. Being in small market Orlando, it -hmm. definitely is something you look at here and say, that's encouraging for the future. Now you have franchises like this making moves like that. I kind of give everybody an A. I I don't know if I'm I'm, I'm, I'm that easy teacher that everybody wants in third period or what, but I... uh, I kind of think everybody wins here. For Portland, you get a, a big that the Suns, of course, they wanted to get rid of for headache and financial reasons, but he's still young. He's still one of the better big men in the NBA, certainly uh, per his age. And and he gets added to a, a core where they were just so backcourt heavy with Simons and Shaden Sharp, and, and now they added Scoot Henderson to the mix. So it's a really good fit there. 
the Suns, for all the reasons you mentioned, they actually add depth. That's the one thing this team didn't have. They've got all the star power in the world. They didn't have role players. They have those now, Grayson Allen, part of the deal. Um, and then and, and then you have uh, the other piece. Well, Milwaukee, obviously, they get Damian Lillard. So yeah. to me, everybody passes here. But it seems like you, you're, you're a little bit – are you, are you no. questioning the Portland side? Who do you think takes the biggest L in all of this? Yeah, it, it could be Portland, right? It very well could be Portland because, uh, you, you know, the Aiden piece might not fit. It, it might ruin, you know, this really nice young group that they have to start with, which I, I just wonder if they had to go a little bit more backwards before they started adding pieces like this. But look, this is probably the, the price you have to pay in the NBA to make a trade and match salary and things like that. It's how it works, right? You can't just take on, you know, one for a hundred. It's got to be pretty much even. And, and I, I ran the numbers this morning in the article that's on spotrack.com right now. Um, incoming outgoing just for this upcoming season, Portland took in about 70 and change and sent out about 71 and a half. So it, that's just how it has to work in this league. And then, you know, to do that, you bring on three or four teams and you make it happen. So I, I'm with you. I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with everybody here. Uh, I guess, uh, the, the financial goggles side of this, right. Which is how I have to operate is concerned about Dame's money, right? <laughs> like, um, could be a gigantic win for Portland just to get out of the literally 215 million here. We're talking three for 150 plus a $63 million player option in four years. Obviously that's not going anywhere if, you know, based on Dame's age and his injury history. Um, you watch a lot of basketball you, and you've watched a, a lot of rebuilds and things like that. I um, live rebuilds. <laughs> I know you do. I know. And you know, I did for a long time here in Buffalo as well. And we're kind of coming out of that window here, but um, Drew Holiday does seem like a player that is really hard to replace. And I know he declined a little bit last year and the defense wasn't as, as crisp as it is, but you're getting no defense out of Dame. None. You are getting star power. You are getting a reason for Giannis to resign. I'm not going to, you know, bounce around that. That's a huge part of this. But I'm not sure this makes them markedly better. Is that is that a fair, you know, assessment here? I don't think it is because of how much okay. better it makes them offensively. This team is so Giannis reliant when it came to postseason basketball. And what we see in the postseason is the isolation game becomes much more important. I need to go get a bucket. I uh, the, the the paint is clogged. Uh, guys get in foul trouble. Become you can't manage minutes the same way. And so at the end of games where the Bucks would get into trouble outside of that one year where they were able to break through and win a championship, and that was also largely because Chris Middleton took that role of guy that can hit the outside shot. Yeah. They didn't have a second punch. They didn't have the guy that could go get the big shot at the end of the game. And if you sent him to the line then you would regret it. Giannis isn't that guy. So he does a lot of great things and he opens this things up. He was opening things up for guys that weren't getting the job done. When the Bucks outside of Giannis were not red hot from three, their offense sputtered. So yeah. as much as it does hurt them defensively, you still have to score points in the NBA. So I think that this helps them a lot. The two-man game between Lillard and Giannis is going to be otherworldly. Do you and, believe and that'll be enough. Do you believe there's a world now where Middleton's on the block at some point soon because of this? Is it that much of an up of an uptick offensively where they could pass on Middleton maybe after this season or halfway through this season when the restriction lifts? I'm sure that they would love to do that. I don't know if they're going to be able to because yeah. he's declined so much. And uh, I haven't looked at his current contract situation, but I don't think he's a guy that other teams are really trying to bring on right now. And yeah. there's a little bit of loyalty there. It is still Milwaukee and – and, and it all comes down to, does Giannis want him on the team? Because if that's the case, you know, this is all about keeping Giannis happy. This is a big move that allows that to hopefully he doesn't end up going anywhere uh, for their sake after a move like this. I wanted yeah. to get your thoughts on that. Do you think that that is this a two year thing where you hope to add another trophy to the trophy case? Or is this a move that, yeah, that's part of it. But you're also angling to say, hey, Giannis, look, we're willing to go all in for you. Yeah, no question. It's a huge part of it. Uh, Giannis was probably largely involved here. Let's be perfectly honest about how these small markets work, right? Um, it doesn't mean anything right now, though. Uh, I mean, he's still not going to sign in the next couple of months because the business side of it says you have to wait until 2024 to let the cap percolate and things like that. So there's going to be this one year 
complete ramp up in Milwaukee to see how this thing works. It's not unlike every time James Harden kind of enters a new team, right? We have to see if it's going to work for a year. There's like that grace period. And then in that case, it seemed to you know explode every time. There's a world where Milwaukee hates this in a year and, and Giannis is moving on and an expiring contract and things like that. But I think this is 70-30, a positive in keeping this band together for, I guess, at least three years with a four-year window for Dame here now, contractually speaking. So um, for those playing along at home, Damian Lillard's contract rolls through the end of this season. He's a free agent. No, the there's a two-year extension art that already kicked in, right? Okay, so it's, it, so there's an upcoming extension with a one-and-one one that goes 55 and 63. So he, it's so that's big the money. Six, that's, that's where the 63 yeah. comes in. So the end yeah. of his contract yeah. uh, is 2026? Yeah, four more years here. Four okay. more years. And that perfectly aligns with Giannis. It does. Yeah, okay. it will. So, so these two are a little bit, you know, now they're sort of tied at the hip in, in, a, in a lot of ways. Yeah, there's worse, there's worse two-packs out there in the league. There's no question about it. So <laughs> I'm excited for it. I, I didn't see it coming because I didn't think Milwaukee had the gumption to be this aggressive, as you kind of alluded yeah. to. Um, I hope this changes the game for a lot of franchises. I really do. Uh, here's the one thing I'll say, and I, and I bet you, you have the same thought. We've seen so many trades recently of superstars, right? Gobert and uh, Donovan Mitchell and all these names that have brought in, what, six, seven draft picks? There's one pick and, a, and, a, and two swaps built into this, and those swaps are conditional now. So it, it wasn't about that at all, clearly. However, I think if they flip Holiday, they'll get two or three more firsts out of this eventually. That's, exact, that's exactly oh, yeah. it. The yeah, holiday. It's, not done. it's incomplete. So yeah. if you're grading this trade, you're, you're, you're jumping the gun. There, there's nothing to grade yet because this is an incomplete move for, from Portland's standpoint. I but think still, just to move Damian picks. Lillard out, just to move Dame off the roster and to bring in Aiton's contract, which is a bit of a, a sinking ship, right? Until it's not, to, to only get one first right now at this stage of the game, to me, seems light. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> if they can get three for Drew Holiday, yeah. then do you feel better about it? Oh, yeah. I think Incredibly. that's what you can get. Yeah, that, there's no part that's part of this package, but it just as it stands now with, you know, a what if still hanging out there. It does seem light in that regard for a team that was trying to at least acquire, you know, draft assets, and and they were pretty public about that. Um, so that's just a it's a real small bugaboo that I have with this. Um, have you had a chance to think Miami here? Because I know like, that's well, sort of in your neck of the woods, right? I mean, are they are they just fine moving forward, being who they are still, or or, or were they relying on this? You think? Uh, no, I mean, and I can speak for the the fan reaction that I've seen yeah. online that I've gotten through my show from Heat fans that that check in there. They're not happy, and uh, you would think Pat from afar, you would think Pat Riley is untouchable for everything that they've been able to accomplish over the years. Even just getting LeBron, you know, like contract for life kind of situation, they are frustrated down yeah. there because think about all the swings and misses that they've now experienced. Donovan Mitchell, they went after. He's on the Cavaliers. Bradley Beal, they tried to get. He's on yeah. the Suns. KD, they tried to get. He's also on the Suns. And Damian Lillard, they were positive. I think they were already printing Lillard jerseys down there. And he's now on the Milwaukee Bucks. So there's a lot of frustration there. I don't think Miami's settled because Miami's been in the boat for all these guys. Then they've done that for a, a very particular reason. Jimmy Butler's clear, clearly not happy. He's calling for tampering. <laughs> I don't know what the next move is, but I know that nobody's happy. I will say this. There's 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 going to be obvious connections to Holiday in Miami. I don't think that's where we're headed here because Portland didn't want to deal with Miami in the first place. Why would they want to do it now? Um, you mentioned Boston out of the gate. That seems like a slam dunk here for Drew Holiday. So I would imagine that's the conversation that starts to ramp up here. There's probably one or two pieces that Boston's trying to trim off right now as they kind of rebuild on the fly with Brad Stevens. Uh, Holiday is a an absolute dream fit to go with Brown and Tatum in that backcourt because of the complementary play that he's style of play that he has. I wouldn't be surprised if within a week that deal is done. Hmm. So you're thinking Boston over so the two of the reports we saw yesterday was that Miami's interested because yeah. they're interested in everybody and Philadelphia. Philadelphia and does Philly, make sense. Yeah. yeah. Does they they sort of tighten things up defensively? Drew Holiday feels like a Nick Nurse guy. They need to kind of, you know, get more adults in the room there. Do you think that – so you would say Boston over those two, right? Yeah. Okay. I would. 
And then I guess the uh, the other portion of this is the domino effect. Does this now impact the next move? We know all these leagues, when we see big moves, there tends to be another one that follows. They say things happen in threes. Is James Harden next now? And is he next quickly because this moves out of the way? I don't know. I he Daryl Morey's so stubborn, but I, I mean, I'm sure you saw the the drama yesterday with that party that Harden threw, where they were basically bashing Morey out loud. It's not going yeah. away. It's not going away. At some point in time, for the good of the franchise, before they step foot on the court and try to be, you know, Eastern Eastern Conference contenders again, they're going to have to clean this mess up one way or another. Um, I, I think Morey would is just fine letting him not play and paying him. You know, we've seen him do it before. Uh, I don't know that there's a trade out there for James Harden. Do you believe there is one? Uh, you know, there are teams like Toronto who probably could still use a player like that. I don't think Harden shows up for some of these teams, you know, literally. And that's the problem here is that he's not motivated. He's not the same player. He does, you know, he did show that he can convert into some sort of facilitator out there, which would be really nice to finish off his career with, you know, and, and maybe grab one or two extra seasons here. But it seems like it's going more south than north in, uh, in a lot of ways here. So I, I don't know that Philly has a play right now because they're not moving Maxi. They're not ready to move Embiid yet. So I just feel like there's too much dysfunction there to make a move like like a holiday. Uh, whereas Boston is, I, I feel like they're rock solid and maybe even have a surplus where they could turn two into one here. Do they have the finances to do it? Because they still, Jalen yeah. Jalen Brown and what will soon be Jason Tatum is going to take up so much of that cap. And they brought yeah. in Chris Stapps, Porzingis. Yeah, it's going to be ugly. But uh, maybe it feels like with Philly's dif- dysfunction and a couple of, you know, Miami not getting their star here, that they they have a one-year window just to crash and, and spend, you know, Mets-type money and go out there and try to do this thing. I mean, it doesn't always work. But I have a feeling they have a chip on their shoulder right now and, and pulling in a player like Holiday, who, by the way, is one for 37 plus a $40 million option next year. So you can call him basically a one-year rental here if he's going to opt out for a multi-year extension after this year. So everything fits up for a team like Boston to snag him for one year. Uh, in terms of the, the the luxury tax for Milwaukee, before we move on to other items that we have here on today's show, where do the Bucks fit in in terms of a luxury tax pen- penalty? I would assume having Giannis and Damian Lillard puts you over that cap. Yeah, they're about $16 million over right now, which alludes to about a $50 million tax bill. So we've seen way worse. Um, you know, Milwaukee was sort of going to be in this camp anyway. Uh, they were able to move multiple pieces off of their roster here to bring in Dame. So that certainly helps to sort of sedate things a little bit. And there's always deadline moves. You know, there's a, like I said, maybe somebody talks himself into Chris Middleton at the trade deadline, things like that. So um, as of now, they're slightly over willing to pay that tax to bring Dame in and make sure that they can at least... Uh, you know, woo, woo Giannis back for a couple more seasons after this. Okay, so before I before I move on, transition, we've got some NFL topics. We've got our quick hits that we're going to get to here. Is there any stone that you think needs to be unturned now? There are a million angles to this, but is there one that you need to get to before we transition? No, I don't have like an axe to grind like I did last week with Mahomes. Okay. No, I'm, I'm in a pretty good headspace here. I'm trying to figure out if, uh, you know, too many people are betting the Dolphins and I should take the local hometown team here, Buffalo, and uh, and hope for a shootout and run with it. But no, I, I think it's uh, it's honestly shaping up to be a heck of a sports week here, starting with yeah. even Thursday night's game here NFL, you know, tonight, which is a rare, nice divisional matchup, even though I think the Thursday night part of it might, you know, keep it tempered somewhat. The best Thursday night game that we've had so far this season, yeah. if you don't count the season opener. Let's talk about Mike Williams, the Chargers wide receiver. He's the latest star player to get in the news because he's done for the year ACL injury. The Chargers cannot stay healthy to save their lives the last several years. Mm-hmm. What kind of money does he lose in all of this? And do you think he'll ever suit up in L.A. again? Yeah, he was guaranteed two for 40. This is the last year of that guarantee. So he's going to make everything he was supposed to earn this year. Uh, that 20 million next year is non-guaranteed. There's an early roster bonus, which probably means LA moves on from him early March, 13, 14, or something like that. Especially with the fact that they drafted Quentin Johnson last year to sort of replace at least him, maybe him and Keenan Allen, who's also probably a roster bubble candidate next March. Um, seems like Eckler's healthy, so that's maybe a positive yin and yang here in terms of losing Williams for the upcoming, you know, next few weeks. But uh, I don't think he's back. It seems like they're they're going to have to replenish some things 
uh, especially some expensive contracts to get back into the draft a little bit with Herbert's 55 million on the books now, right? It was really, yeah. Well, it was really good timing drafting a, a receiver in the first round. Also, I guess if you're going to replace a guy like Mike Williams, uh, you, you ought to go and turn to the guy that you just took with one of the first 32 picks in the draft. Yep. And by the way, not terrible for Mike Williams because he's not yet 30. He signed a three-year deal. He and Chris Godwin, same agent, right? Tori Dandy did this with a ton of wide receivers. They signed two, three, four-year deals across the board, across the league. And it sounds like it's bad news for, for Williams, but he was always ever going to get the two-year guarantee, right? The 40 million guarantee was always all he was going to get. So instead of having three more years where the Chargers can slow play him back, keep him under this contract, he can essentially work himself back, maybe take a showcase deal next year. And then at age 30, Maybe there's $30 million a year out there for a player like him. It's completely possible, and it's all because he took a short contract two years ago. He's not a franchise tag candidate, though. I mean, I don't think he's quite good enough well, to well, be Because he's under contract, so they're going to have to cut him. They're going to have to cut him, so he wouldn't be a right. candidate for that. So, uh, you, you know, they release him out of the $20 million. Maybe he signs on with Kansas City next year at, like, one for eight, that Juju Smith-type type deal, and, and plays himself back into a multi-year guarantee after that. That would be uh, that would be nasty to see that together. Uh, Dan Graziano of ESPN reporting that Jonathan Taylor still has no interest in playing for the Indianapolis Colts, and that the Colts have no interest in signing him long term. So um, four weeks into this, and nothing has changed. Here's where it gets interesting, though. The Miami Dolphins were the team that was reportedly hot after Jonathan Taylor. Well, they just rushed for 350 yards oh over the weekend. Oh my god! So if I'm if I'm Miami, I go. You know what? I, yeah, we're I good. Don't know. I don't know yeah. if we need this guy. We'll save that second round pick. No, um, I still think he moves, right? There are teams that still need him. There's no question about it. But the, but Miami being the favorite is completely off the table. There's no question about that because they're they're doing this without Jeff Wilson. They still have another weapon to come off the, the pup list and, and hit the ground running. So uh, I, I think they're completely out of it. You know, Indy's doing just fine as well, by the way. I mean, Zach Moss with a with a half broken arm is doing just fine out there for them. So Everybody's kind of holding up their end of the bargain. I still think Baltimore has a need. It sounds like they don't want to negotiate during the season like this and don't want to give up a high draft pick to bring in a player like that. That's not their style. I don't know. We mentioned the Chargers. If they want to stay relevant, this is the kind of guy that could, that could you know, supplant Josh Kelly, who's done nothing in three years for this franchise, and just sit there next to Austin Eckler as the ground and pound guy and, and become a really nice short weapon for, for Justin Herbert. Uh, I, I'd add them to the list for sure. And then who knows, you know, there's a, there's a lot of teams that are going to find some running back injuries over the next two weeks here before that Halloween deadline. I think Baltimore, you're right. Uh, just looking at the contenders that need help in the run game yeah. makes a lot of sense. The chiefs could be a team that you could still mention. I, Isaiah Pacheco is still just an average NFL player. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, what about it? Uh, there, there was another one here that I was going to bring up. I'm totally blanking on it. Well, um, Ramondi Stevenson has been nothing. I mean, the, if the Patriots are going to try to contend with this defense, at least for a wild card, they do make moves like this. They would yeah. take on him as a one-year rental and then not franchise tag and let him walk. So uh, they're in. They're, they're a slight kind of a, you know, a wild card kind of team for this play. But there's a lot of teams out west. No question. The Rams could still do this. That might have been the team you were thinking of. It was Green uh, Bay. Because Green Bay okay. was reportedly okay. part of that conversation yeah. originally. And and we would think like okay well if AJ AJ Dillon pops off we know what Aaron Jones is as a player yeah. maybe you don't really need this guy AJ Dillon's been terrible yeah um, he he's only getting worse so if and Aaron Jones is injured constantly you need to help Jordan Love if he's going to stay as efficient as he's been I think Green Bay could be a part I love of the it mix. I love it and is that AJ Dillon in a in a conditional second is that all it takes here probably right just to just to send him back yep. Um, so that team's up there. That's probably a top three team right now. But no question, Miami's out. There's there's just no need to do that right now until something drastic happens. Yeah, especially if they run all over your Buffalo Bills. I will cross my fingers and hope that that is the case. Let's get to some quick hits before we wrap up here. Ronald Acuna Jr., the man that I should have drafted with the first overall pick in my fantasy baseball draft at the start of the year, uh, becomes the first ever 40 home run, 70 steal player in baseball history. Does this now make him easily the most underpaid underpaid player in all of major league baseball pretty crazy so we uh i'm not sure a lot of people know we do this we have a system where we run stats and metrics and all these like fantasy grades and stuff behind the scenes and we actually generate a best value list for every single sport every week we run it every single week and update it every single week 
Acuna is at the top of this list. Now, this isn't veterans or players with contracts. This is every single 2,000 plus players in Major League Baseball right now. And Acuna Jr. is the best value in all of baseball on an eight-year, $100 million contract. So that's how that's how much he's outplaying what he's currently being made right now. He should be in arbitration three this year. Um, he's making $17 million cash, which is probably about right for his arbitration salary. There's one more year of arbitration eligibility next year. Again, he'll make $17 million. The problem is he continues to make $17 million for the next four more years, five more total here. So uh, it, that's insane. That's where this contract really sort of deflates itself, it, which is fine. We'll, we'll buy out the arbitration properly, but a nice raise is kicking in in two years, right? Well, it's not. Yeah. So it flatlines. It's a crazy deal. I've been saying this since it was signed. It might be the best value the Braves have ever given out, and they've given out a dozen nice deals here. But yeah, no question that he he had this kind of potential, and uh, he's already outkicked his coverage. No question. Is, is there anything that he can do to Gosh. up that level of pay in the next year? Do we see like a Patrick Mahomes deal, right? Where the Braves go, look, man, we didn't know you're going to steal 70 bases. Here's an extra 60 million, right? No, yeah. no other team but the Chiefs does this. I'll say it again from last week. Nobody else is going to do this. <laughs> it's going to become a weekly requir requirement to get Mike all fired up about the Kansas City Chiefs and the way that they structure things. So we saw the Utah they knew Jazz. They had Taylor money coming, by the way. Taylor Swift yeah. money coming. That's what it oh, was. They knew that right. was coming. Yeah. I, I guess, you know what, I'll just jump to the Taylor Swift question. I, I don't know if you've heard this or not, but Travis Kelsey reportedly dating Taylor Swift. Yeah. How beneficial has this been for the Kelsey brand? Oh now, and in the future, just think about what this means for Kelsey beyond his football life, which is he's only a couple of years away from. That's all I've been thinking about. And by the way, I was thinking this before Taylor Swift ever, ever became part of this equation. I already thought he was going to be the next version of Dwayne Johnson. The personality was there. He was great on SNL. Yeah. He's, he's, he's a commercial hound, with, which tight ends never are, right? And Gronk was only a, a, a commercial hound because he was goofy and a doofus. Yeah. That's not Kelsey. Kelsey has charisma and personality. So, I, I mean, I, I, the sky's the limit for this guy. And now if he's attached to the hip to Taylor Swift, I mean, the numbers out there, I know like front office sports and a couple of those, of those vet ventures have already done the math. It's like 400% increase across the board on social, on everything. So, um, I, I mean, he might outsell jerseys for Patrick Mahomes this year. That might be a real thing. I think he's doing it right now. It might continue to happen if she keeps showing up. And it sounds like she's going to be there Sunday night, which is going to be an epic rating for NBC. I mean, she's always been popular uh, as long yeah. as she's been on the scene, but it has hit a different stratosphere the only thing i can think to compare it to as far as like a worldwide phenomenon is michael jackson uh yeah it, it just feels like it's on that level where anything she touches turns to gold i think and i don't have the numbers to back this up but i would just think common sense wise she's probably getting deandre swift jersey sales just because <laughs> they share a last name and he's got nothing to do with this story well, Philly's would, banking off this nicely. That was that was pretty well done by them, the Swift and Kelsey matchup there. So I, I love that as well. Um, it's good for the NFL, right? Mike, when, when's the last time we had a positive story get this kind of attention, right? Generally, it's all negative. Somebody's arrested yeah. or whatever, you know? I, so week four, and this is what we're dealing with. I think it's pretty awesome. Uh, my favorite thing to date uh, over the past week is the the, the, the rash sales of of t-shirts that say Taylor Swift's boyfriend, right? They're not even referencing him <laughs> yeah. As, as, oh, yeah. as Travis Kelsey know. anymore. That name is gone. You are now his boy, her boyfriend, and that's it. So that uh, is, it's uh, hit all new levels, and it's going to ramp up Sunday, no question. That shirt is sitting in the cart right now for oh. my life. So <laughs> and, uh, we have... We, I say we, haven't pulled the trigger yet. We'll see if it ends up in the Kravitz household. The Utah Jazz have become the latest team in the NBA to create a direct-to-consumer con streaming platform. It's going to allow their fans to watch games for $15 a month. There's a tiered structure to it. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. The Suns are reportedly giving their games for free to yeah. their fans. Do you think that these business models, I know that they're slightly different because when you get to pay for the other you don't. Do you think that these can work? compared to what these teams were getting from TV partners that seem to be going away. I'm really interested to see the Suns numbers, not to take over that, you know, the, the, the B before the A there, but if the Suns can make this work and, and the owner ends up front loading, you know, the user experience essentially to take on the advertising money, if there's more, if there are more eyeballs there, 
he will sell more advertising. You know what I mean? That's the, the thought process here is let's just get him in. It's sort of how we deal with, you know, the dot com era. Do we do we put ourselves completely behind a paywall or do we want to get more eyeballs on spot track and then go from there? And we've obviously chosen the latter here. So I, I, I like this model only because everything else in the world is going subscription based. Everything else is pay a dollar here, pay five dollars here. Right. And I think it's just riding on most of the fan bases in the sports community. So I'm really interested to see if if this Ishba stuff works and that he can front load his way into even more money on the back end because of it. Because I do think the singular model that Utah's putting out there, my God, baseball needs it more than anybody, right? I mean, there's so much, it's so difficult to watch a baseball game if you're not, you know, where you usually are at any point in time. So everything has to change and get better. But the NBA has always been on the forefront of this. I mean, you can buy just the fourth quarter on on the NBA app and things like that. It's They've always been sort of pioneers. And these are two examples that I'm really interested to see how they work out over the next couple of months here. And it helps the the streaming folks that are out there. I've I cut the cord a while ago. I watch TV via YouTube TV and then whatever other subscriptions I have. The problem is YouTube TV for me doesn't get the local regional channels where Magic Basketball would air. And I know a lot of other people that run into that. I think the I've heard that they deal with that in Denver with the Nuggets, and that team just went on. Uh, yeah. finals run during so that run yeah you need people to watch your product so however you can make that happen that is that's the most important thing you sell tickets you sell merchandise that way sponsorship advertisement like you said i, I mean it just seems so obvious even yeah. if it even if it potentially costs you a few dollars uh just the, the just the value that that has for your community um i think it's something that everybody should do but that's also pie in the sky thinking i'm thinking like a consumer not a businessman but Uh, Let's wrap with this. Broncos versus Bears this weekend. The two most dysfunctional franchises in the NFL right now. So I'm going to ask you two very difficult questions here. Who wins the game and who's more likely to retain their quarterback beyond 2023? All right, that's fair. I'll answer with a personal personal decision I made just this morning. I'm going to start Justin Fields in my fantasy league. Good for um, you. Because I think... I think Chicago's bad, and I understand that they are underdogs against this Denver team that just gave up 70 points to your Dolphins. But I think Denver's bad. I think Denver's defense was always bad and got worse with some training camp injuries and got even worse last week with another linebacker injury. And I think Justin Fields is looking around saying, all right, well, this team obviously didn't do enough to elevate me into a passing quarterback. I'm just going to run the hell out of the ball and I'm going to take all those running points in fantasy this week and bank on them. So I, I think if the bears are going to be dysfunctional, it's just going to become Justin Fields show and I'm here for it. So I, right now I'm picking that. That doesn't mean he's their quarterback. In fact, I think it means less that (laughs) that Justin Fields will be the franchise quarterback because he's reverting back to the player. They don't want him to be. Um, But you know, Russell's fully guaranteed through 2024. And if he sticks next March, he'll be fully guaranteed through 2025. So Unless Sean Payton's leaving, I don't know what Denver's going to be doing over the next 18 to 24 months otherwise. Who's your other quarterback? What's this decision that you have here? It's Jordan Love tonight, okay. which I just don't like the Thursday night angle. That's all I'm doing. Yeah. Well, I mean, the Broncos did just give up 70. Hard, yeah. Kind of hard to argue with that one. Interesting that you've got three teams I think are vying for that top spot in the draft that all have what is supposed to be a franchise quarterback. The Broncos – the bears and the Vikings all have a guy. And here are the uh, lowly Cardinals with Josh Dobbs playing some scrappy football. Can't even get his own Jersey. Incredible story. That was great. That does it for this week's edition or today's edition rather of the spot track pods uh, podcast. If you love the content you hear on this channel, follow rate review, subscribe. We greatly appreciate it. Love being involved. And uh, today's show was an absolute uh, blast. SpotTrack.com for all of the latest in the sports contractual world. Till next time.